All right, thrilled to be with you. Imagine the church has now been born and it's been going on for several years and everything's going fantastic. And as it expands across ethnic lines and cultural lines and even into the the big, wide, scoping Roman Greek world with all of its different religions, as it spreads across there, it's almost like, like in Acts 15, we get a little pause in the button before we travel off into some other place and we make sure that we're clear about how we'll think about God and how we gain access to God and what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. We make sure that we're clear on how we're going to communicate and operate as a community of people and how we're going to set policies and, and make decisions for the kingdom and not just for ourselves. It's almost like Acts 15 gives us that, gives us this little chance to say, let's be straight about how we think. Let's be straight about um, what Jesus has done for us and what that means in terms of how we treat other people. So let me pray for us. We're going to be in Acts 15. If you don't turn on your device and turn it there or open your Bibles, Acts 15, verse 1. Um, we'll take, uh, spend our time together on that. Let me pray. God, thank you for the privilege of being able to gather, for the truth that we have sung, and the, now the opportunity to open your word. We ask that you would shape us, not only individually, but as a community together, that that grace and faith would mark our theology, that wisdom and love would mark our behavior, and that the kingdom would drive our decisions and our policies as we need to make them so that your glory will manifest itself among us, that your goodness, your, your will would be accomplished in us. Use this time, please, for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, here's what's happening. The gospel message went out. Remember, we looked at it last week. Paul and Barnabas went out into all these areas and they went into the Greek world, began to share the gospel with them. We already saw that happen in earlier chapters of Acts, but now it is full on going. And the message is going out and it's being braced, embraced. It, it, to, to give you some idea of the scale of how quickly Christianity spreads in the first few hundred years, by the time you, we have statistics. Now, I don't know how much you would trust fourth century statistics, but um, when we can't even trust our own. But we have, a, we have statistics that say that at least 50% of the Roman world by the year 350 AD had heard and embraced the gospel of Jesus. That's crazy. That quickly? And so it is, it is on. I mean, it is full on. And in the midst of this, there's, this came out, remember, Jesus was fully Jewish and came out of the traditions of, of the law and the Torah. And as they've, they've, there's, now there's this discussion, okay, now that you've come to Christ by faith and what Jesus has done, now how do you live in it? What do you do to stay in it? And there were a group of people that said, well, you gotta be circumcised, you gotta, you gotta embrace the Jewish faith, you've got to begin to um, operate under their dietary restrictions and under their ceremonial restrictions. And is Christianity going to be just a, a, a shoot of Jewish faith or is it actually going to be its own faith? Well, we didn't meet on Saturday morning and uh, we're here. So you know that we broke off. But how did that actually happen? How was it determined? Here it is right here in, in Acts 15. And some people are saying, if you're going to stay a Christian, if you want to be in on this thing, you got to be circumcised. you got to keep the Jewish law. you got to do all of these things. Verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. That's the Bible's nice way of saying people are ticked big time. And they're arguing over whether you have to do something other than faith to be saved. 
And so because of this argument, they decide, this church in Antioch says, let's send some folks to represent us. Let's send some folks down to Jerusalem and let's figure this out. And so that's what they did. And just you know, on sake of time, I'm going to just tell you kind of what happens is they, they begin to move their way down there. And there are basically three testimonies that kind of sway the whole decision. The first one is Peter's. And, and here's what Peter says, essentially. Peter's response is this. Number one, y'all know that when I preached to Cornelius and all of those Roman dudes, they all came to faith just like us. They weren't circumcised. They didn't do the Jewish law, but the Holy Spirit came on just like he came on us and they were saved just like we were. Y'all already have seen the testimony over and over again of what I've told you has already happened. That's what Peter says. It's his first argument. Second argument is this. Really? Really? You're gonna ask the Gentiles to do what we haven't been able to do for 2,000 years? Follow the law? Follow all of the... We've never been able to do it. Our fathers weren't able to do it. Our grandfathers, our fathers, 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 fathers weren't able to do it. Nobody's been able to do this. Why are we gonna put this restriction on them? We've no, no one's ever able to follow it because that's not what the law wasn't given for us to follow. The law wasn't given to save us. It was to show us. I said this last week. The law was given to show us that we needed saving. To show that next to God's righteousness and holiness, we can't keep up. Unless God intervenes on our behalf, we'll, and we got to do it on our own. We're never getting there. Peter says, you saw that in Cornelius, him get saved, and you saw You've seen our own experience. We can't do the law. First response. Second response is Barnabas and Paul. And they just begin to tell the stories of all that we talked about last week. When we, you should see what happened in Cyprus when we talked to the governor and all these people. And Paul told this one magician, dude, be blind. And he went blind. You can't believe it. He did just begin to tell all of these stories about people coming to Christ and Gentiles embracing the faith and being saved. And then finally, James. Now, there's, just, there's several Jameses, so it's hard to keep up with which Jim this is. But this is James, not James the Apostle um, with Christ. This, he's been killed already. So this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. This is James who by now, after several years, is the leader of the Jerusalem church because of the prominent role he has in Acts 15, what we call the Jerusalem Council. He, he is the leader going on there, and he is also the man who will give us the book of James. He's the author of that book. And this is what he says, and he's, he responds very differently than the other two. He responds very much speaking Abrahamic Old Testament law kind of talk. But what he does is, is he uses the prophecies in those scriptures of the Old Testament to show how they were always pointing that this was God's plan all along. It was always going to go to the Gentiles. It was never meant to stay with us. Salvation was to and through the Jewish community to the world. And he says, we've always known this. We've read it in Amos and some of our other prophets have told us that it was always gonna be opened up to the Gentile world. And now watch what happens. And so he, they basically say this from what's going on in there. You can see in verse nine, it says, Jesus made no distinction between the Greeks and us for he purified their hearts by faith. Nothing is meant or needed except for faith in what Christ has done. And this message, verse 11, we believe is through grace. Faith and belief in what Christ has done through God's grace, not our own merit or work. So James says in verse 19, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, to abstain from sexual immorality and from meat strangled, of strangled animals and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city in the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. What just happened? What? I mean, if you're following along, I know y'all are reading Acts 
13 through 20, trying to read through those chapters every week, once a week, to just to familiarize yourself with the book of Acts. So this is not the first time you've seen these words, but you should have read it and gone. The line says, Peter says, don't worry about it. Paul and Barnabas say, don't worry about it. James says, don't worry about it. And then James says, yeah, but don't do these things. What? What happened? The issue moved from salvation to fellowship. The issue moved from how do you get in to how do we act once we're in? So, first we got to get right. How do you get in? And we've got to get the gospel correct. We've got to understand what the scriptures teach us about what Jesus has done on our behalf. And faith and grace drive our theology. That's not part of your handout. This was later in the week insights that I got. So write this in because it would be there had I gotten it earlier. Faith and grace drive our theology. Get these two right, and they are the safeguards against all kinds of junk. Get them wrong, and you're going to get a lot wrong. So let me walk you through this. What did Jesus accomplish? What did his death and resurrection accomplish on our behalf? The, the theological construct around salvation, the, one of the best short answers is this combination of words, substitutionary atonement. Now, you know what these words mean. If you've ever watched a sporting event when somebody gets hurt, a substitute comes in. You know what these mean if you've ever gone to school and had a teacher get sick and a substitute comes in. It's someone who steps into the place of someone with the full authority and responsibility of the person they've replaced. Atonement, you also know, although we use the word a little bit less, if you've ever paid a fine for anything, a late check, late on your rent, a speeding ticket, anything like that, you've made atonement for something you've done wrong. The teachings of the scripture collectively are this. Jesus Christ took on flesh to become a man so that he could be our substitute, living a perfect life, step into the place on Calvary's hill that we deserved and bear the penalty for sin. Being God, he was able to bear the full brunt of all of mankind as our substitute. And there on Calvary's cross, he paid the full demand of a holy, just God for all of the evil and wrong ever done. He paid a price we could never even begin to pay, not only for our own sin, but for anyone else's sin. Jesus, as our substitute, has made full atonement. And now by faith in that work, we are declared righteous. Now, let me show you this in several places. Stick with me. I'm going to read a lot of different verses. Stick with me here on how this plays itself out. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 21. Now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference or distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, made righteous, Freely by his grace, not our own merit. Through the redemption, the buying back that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, paying a sacrifice to pay for a fine through faith in his blood. Romans chapter five, beginning at verse 18. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all people, so also the result of the act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man came the many who were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man made the many will be made righteous. Romans chapter eight, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus 
Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. That as we place our faith in Christ, that his righteousness is actually the term, theological term is, is imputed onto us so that we are now seen in his righteousness. Who did not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. On Going on, Galatians, Paul begins the book to the church in Galatia with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Later on in the book of Galatians, he says, I've been crucified with Christ but it's no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in this flesh, this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians is also opened with the same kind of a theme in chapter one, verse seven. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, bought back through his death on the cross, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of our own merit. No, and according to the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us with all wisdom and understanding. Colossians 1 also begins with this same theme. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption bought out the forgiveness of sins. Christ's work on the cross was absolutely accepted and totally complete in terms of the forgiveness of God. And it is offered freely to any who would believe by his grace, not your merit, not your skill, not your nationality, not whether you deserve it, not what you've done, not what you did, not what you will do. Grace is absolutely extended to all people absolutely free. This is the gospel. This is crazy good. This is crazy good. Now, so we are saved by grace through faith. And we must get this part right. If we, if we get it wrong and we, and we just say, you know what, don't worry, we can just kind of go wherever we want. His grace is just, it's free and we can just do whatever we want. Then you become, you know, a, kind of a syncretist where you just accept everything or you get, you get these laws around things. You say, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. We got, we, we, yeah, we're saved by grace, but we got to stay saved by works. And you got to do this and do this and do this. And by the way, what we usually say when we say do this are the stuff that we don't have trouble doing. You know, you're really good at not drinking because you can't stand the taste of alcohol. So you just tell everybody, wait, if you're going to be a believer, you shouldn't drink. We always pick our kind of a deal. So it's we're saved by this in this faith by God's grace. We don't need any, do anything to get it other than place faith in Christ. We don't need to do a thing to keep it and we won't need to do anything in the future to keep it. There's nothing you can do that'll cause God to love you more or less than he loves you right now. Now that's, that's great news and that's really, that's really fantastic. I, I'm, I'm, I've never gotten over when grace hit me in the face and, and got my attention. I've never gotten over the fact that God would love me this way. But like James in the first century at the Jerusalem council, how do we get along with all that? How do we make this all work? If grace and faith drive our theology, then love and wisdom, I'd write this down, love and wisdom needs to drive our behavior. What Paul, what James basically says is, yeah, we're saved by grace. You don't have to do anything to get it. But if you're going to really be effective at sharing the gospel with these people, then you're going to have to distinguish yourselves from the worship that's going on in the culture. All this food sacrificed to idol, all the blood that's poured all over everything, all the sexual immorality and those temple prostitution things that's going on. You need to step back and separate yourself from that. 
He's simply saying that to be effective with the gospel, we have to be distinguished from our culture. Now, how do we navigate? How do we navigate in such a way where love and and wisdom kind of drive our behaviors? Well, when we talk through the book of 1 Corinthians, I I found a place in 1 Corinthians 8 that, that just radically changed how I make decisions about whether I should and could do something. And I use this all the time when I talk with individuals who are saying, hey, I think we're going to do this. What do you think? Or I think we're going to do this. What do you think? Here's four questions, four questions to guide us through determining where we can go. Now, now watch. We've already determined our theology. It's faith by grace, the work of Christ. This is not about this is this is our theology. Now, in that theology, how do we behave? How do we get along? How do we have a community that can be unified and respectful, that can really model the love of Jesus rather than just go on all half cocked all in all directions? Four questions, four questions that we can use. The first one is this, can I do this? Now, what this means is not physically am I capable. What I'm asking really is, is there a command against it? Is there something already in God's word where it's commanded again, that I'm commanded not to do it? Like if you were to say alcohol, we'll use alcohol for a, as an illustration as we go through kind of some of these questions. Let's use alcohol. Alcohol, you could say, can I drink? Well, the answer to that is in moderation, yes. But also, it's very clear in the scriptures, don't get drunk. Guess what don't means? Do not. We clear here? Now you, you can do some hermeneutical gymnastics to get around this and try to justify your own behavior, but I'm gonna tell you right now, it's very clear in the scriptures. Do not get drunk. But I'll also tell you just as clearly, there are no commands to not drink at all. Now, if you're a teetotaler and you got a verse, come show me. So the first one is, is can I do it? Is there a command against it? Your boss just ticks you off. You'd like to kill him. You'd like to murder him right there on the spot. Let's see. Let's go through this. Can I do it? Nope. (laughs) We got that one. Okay. We got that one. There's some big universally morally wrong sins Murder, stealing, lying, adultery, drunkenness, gluttony. Those things are all committed. They're committed to us in the New Testament. You don't have to go to Old Testament places to find them. These are are things that we're commanded to do. It's revealed to you already. You need not seek any more. Can I do it? And if you can, then you go to the next question, okay? And the next question is, is not only can I do this, but should I do it? So that that becomes a question of, does my conscience agree that it's okay for me to do this? Does my my conscience give me the freedom to be able to to move forward into this without any check in my spirit about it? In other words, you got all these things that it says don't do, but there's lots of things that you can't really figure out. And these are just a list of some of them that we've argued about in the church over the years. Drinking alcohol, I already admit, admit it, uh, used, but dancing, playing cards, smoking tobacco, R-rated movies, tattoos, whether you should be a cowboy fan or not. There's not a verse in there about this, although some people have tried to tell, you know, draw some parallels for me. Those are matters of conscience. Here's the, here's the amazing thing, and this is why it's so difficult, is that we, I could take these six or eight people right in here, and I could say, all right, let's talk about drinking. And some people in the group would say, I, I can drink with, with an absolute clear conscience. And there might be some people in the, in the group that would say, I can't touch a drop. It's absolutely wrong for me and my conscience. You understand that, right? There are some things that are universally wrong, but there's a lot of things that are kind of in the gray about whether you should do it or not dancing, 
take some people in the room back to a clubbing experience in your younger days. It's not that you can't dance. There's no command against it. But whenever you go into that kind of environment, it just takes you back to bad thoughts, bad places. It's just not good for your spirit. You have a check in your conscience. You're just wise enough to say, okay, can I do it? And then should I do it? But there's still two more questions that you need to ask. The next one would be, what does my weakness require? I made a decision when I was 22 years old that I would stop drinking. And for 30 years, I didn't drink. And it wasn't because I had a verse that said don't. And it wasn't because I was a pastor, because I wasn't. I was a football coach. It was because I had a weakness inside of my disposition that never wanted one beer. I always wanted six. I always wanted eight. Now, I don't know if that disposition is genetic. Both my parents were alcoholics. But I, it just was my weakness inside of me was uh, something that I just couldn't go there. In, in any environment, in any, up until the age of 22, every time I had tried to drink, I always overdrank. Some of you know what I'm talking about and you get it. Others, you have weak, others of, of you have weaknesses in other areas that you shouldn't do this. It's just gonna take you someplace. Now here's what it'll do. It'll take you one or two directions. One, it'll take you to a category one sin that you shouldn't do. Like I, if I drink a beer, I'm gonna want six beers, which means I'm gonna get drunk. I got a do not drunk command. Do not get drunk command. You understand what I'm saying? So that's gonna take me a place where I know I'm not supposed to go. Or it's gonna take me in an area where I'm gonna elevate something or someone to an area of prominence that might be competing with God. So here's another example, Rolex watch. Let's say that somebody in the room, let's, let's make, no, that's, that's too personal. Somebody at South Hills <laughs> watching this wants a Rolex watch. Now, is there, let's go through it. Can they do it? Is there a command against Rolex watches? No, there's no so you can do it. Should you do it? Well, that's a budgetary concern that we'd have to talk about because you shouldn't go in debt just so you got something on your wrist. But um, let's say that they, they got the money. But then this, what does my weakness require? The truth is, is that maybe pursuing this watch, this is a silly example, I don't know why I picked it, but um, this, um, this, maybe pursuing this watch will become so important to you that that'll be all you think about. And just that pursuit, you now that, that watch in some kind of weird, silly way. Don't look at me that way. We do this. We do this. We're all, we think about everything. We, everywhere we look, everybody's wearing a Rolex. So you just, and now it gets elevated into an area of prominence where your, your walk, your faith walk has been damaged. It didn't, it didn't cause you to go over here. It just caused you to, put, to elevate in something into a, to where now you're coveting something and now you've gone to a category one sin. It's where your weakness will take you. Is the watch wrong? No, but you're, you're just not able to have a Rolex yet. Just you know, go overseas somewhere, buy one of those cheap off things that say Rolex that aren't really it and just deal with it. <laughs> you can just move on. Can I do it? Should I do it? What's my weakness require? And then third, fourth, what do my friends need? What am I... What, what, how does love enter into this? What do my friends need? In other words, it might be fine. Let me just give it to you this way. There's nothing like a really greasy hamburger and an ice cold beer. I, we're gonna have that in heaven. Get used to it, get ready for it. So um, th that's a combination of food groups. That's, that's a good combination of food groups. But I would never, after a service is here, say on a Saturday evening or a Sunday morning, I would never leave Toga and go across to Red Robin and enjoy an ice cold beer and a big old greasy burger. I would just not do that. Now, why would I not do that? Can I do it? Yeah. Should I do it? It's fine with me. It's my week. I don't have a check in my conscience. But somebody who just came to Westgate for the very first time might walk in and they'd freak out seeing the pastor drinking a cold beer. They're just not ready for that yet. 
They got to live. What now? Once they've been with me a while, they won't be surprised. But they need a little warming up. You know what I'm saying? So I have the, every right to have a cold beer at Red Robin. And I could say to someone, you know, grow up, get used to it. Or I could say, go somewhere else. The beer ain't worth it. That's pretty easy, right? You know, I talk all the time about how I love white Ford F-150 trucks. I could get one. You know why I don't have one? Number one, there's 60 freaking thousand dollars. That's one reason why. I mean, it's that much for a truck stupid to me. But secondly, secondly, I just don't know. I don't know if some of y'all could handle it. I mean, you might, what would you think if all of a sudden I drove up in a big old $60,000 brand new truck? Go for it. Yeah. Some of you would say, yeah, go for it. But there might be some in the room who'd say, wow, man, that's a lot of money. Dude's doing okay. You know, maybe, uh, you see what I'm saying? If there's, if there's a chance that anything that I do might look extravagant or frivolous, let me just tell you, I got a 2003 Tundra. Every time I stick the key in that sucker, it starts. And so far, it'll pull everything I've hooked behind it. It's fine. That it ain't, the truck ain't worth it because love drives our lives. Grace and faith drive our theology and love and wisdom drive our behavior. Now, one more story and I almost left it out, but it's just too good to, to look at Acts 15 without taking a quick look at it. Acts 15 so they've gone through, they get this letter of endorsement. They say, y'all are doing great. Just go back and keep preaching Jesus by grace, but be sensitive to the people around you in your worship context. Make sure that you don't do things that would be just completely offensive to people. And then verse 36, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Barney, what do you say we pack the bags and go back and visit all the people we went to on that last journey. Let's go see how they're doing. See if the churches are growing. Maybe we can even share with some new people along the way. What do you say, Barney? And Barney went, yeah. Perfect idea. We've been here long enough. Let's go back out. But watch this. Verse 37. Barney said, Hey, I'd like to take that John Mark guy. John Mark, I'd like to take him with us. You remember the guy who left us in Pamphylia? Yeah, that guy who, who got kind of, he got weirded out and left us and deserted us. I think he deserves a better, another chance, a second chance. I mean, I think he's got real gift. Man, I'd like to give him another chance. What do you say, Paul? Verse 38, Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And Barnabas took John Mark, Paul took Silas, and they went different ways. Now, misunder don't misunderstand. This is, a, this is a sharp argument. This is a disagreement on how we move forward. But they didn't jump on Facebook and call each other scum sucking pigs. <laughs> they didn't tweet all over the internet talking about what an idiot, heretic, dumb rascal they were. They did it in such a way where they part companies, double the effort for the kingdom, and both live fruitful team lives. 
Barnabas, the son of encouragement, which is what his name means, takes this John Mark dude along, moves at a little bit slower pace, and builds him up to the point where he writes a gospel. The gospel of Mark is written by this dude who quit. Now, can we all agree, if you're good enough to write a gospel, you're good enough. That's a pretty good deal. Paul takes Silas. A little bit later, they pick up Timothy. Then they pick up Priscilla and Aquila and they pick up Apollos. They drop Silas off it to be a, and Luke goes with them too eventually. And then you put Silas in one of those churches and he puts Timothy and puts him in Ephesus eventually for the book of Ephesians. And you get all of these places. And what happens is, is instead of one team going out like this, it goes out like this because when they disagree, they disagree in respect. And they still move for the kingdom. The kingdom's advancement drives their decision-making process. I, listen, we, I, we're not looking for conformity here. When I look out on you, I don't see a bunch of bricks all shaped the same size, meant to put in the slots all on top of one another, exactly like the other. Scripture's Peter himself actually said, he described you as living stones, all shaped in totally different ways, fitting all together in weird kind of conglomerations that makes a, a house and builds a wall that you'd never expected, never could accomplish on your own. We have to do life in respect, not when we agree, that's easy. That's child's play, anybody can do that. When we sharply disagree and we still bring glory, we still move forward. We're not good at this because you know what we do? We just, we just change churches. I'm just gonna change. Now there are good reasons to change. Don't misunderstand me, very good reasons to change. but maybe some of the time you're supposed to stay and learn to respect each other in your disagreement. Grace and faith. Get those two right, driving your theology, and it's, it's hard to screw up anything. You can, but you usually won't. Love and wisdom, driving our behavior the scriptures tell us love covers over a multitude of sin. And there's a multitude of sin in the room, beginning with me. We need love. And a kingdom commitment to the cause of Christ over our own comfort and desires. Driving how we make our decisions will ensure that we have the faith to see God's will and the courage to obey it. Let's pray. Thanks for loving us that way, God, for extending fully into us, for, for not expecting us to like meet you halfway, but for you doing all of the work on our behalf and then offering it free as a gift. What a good father you are. What a good father you are. Would you help us? Help us to live out the goodness you've extended to us in a way that builds us up, expands your kingdom, and glorifies you. May it be so, in Jesus' name, amen.